Welcome to the 2020 Dave Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award. I'm Zainab Selby, and I will be your MC for today's program. I was honored to receive this award in 2010, and I'm honored to be here with all of you as we come together to celebrate this year's honorees, Mark Benioff, Christiana Figuera, and Eddie Ndepo. You will hear more about our honorees later in the program. Before we begin, I wanted to share a few notes on what you can expect out of the next hour and a half. It is important for you to know that tonight's program will have interactive moments. At several points, we will be directing those of you watching live to go to the chat and respond to a question. In fact, how about we get the practice now? Please go to the chat and share where you are watching the program from today. I'm pleased to be joining you from New York. We are so fortunate tonight that we are joined by so many members of the Synergos community. Past honorees, Synergos staff, senior fellows, board and global philanthropist members, and many other friends. Thank you everyone who has come together to help us make today's event a success. Since we couldn't all be together in person this year, we wanted to make sure to include as many voices from our community as possible. As the program goes on, you will hear many people react to a question we as Synergos have been asking ourselves. How do we create positive transformation in a time of division? In this era, as it feels that there is more division than ever before, we feel a new sense of urgency in developing bridging leaders from around the world. I hope you will enjoy listening to and learning from the many bridging leaders in our community. And so with that, enjoy the show. You will first hear from Synergos Community Voices on what division is and how it manifests itself in the world. Division is disruptive, it is dysfunctional, and therefore it creates a society which is centered or which moves around hatred, which moves around dominance, which moves around fear. And what it creates and results into is a dysfunctional economy. Divisions have always been among the greatest barriers to social and economic development. With the pandemic, divisions are becoming deeper and more critical. It has not only deepened the existing social problems, but also intensified the inequalities that we have been trying to tackle for decades. No transformation comes from a single perspective. We are seeing a rise in nationalism and fascism some of the factors strengthening division in the world. Without acknowledging our differences and diversity and embracing humankind as a cornerstone to revive humanity, there will be no true transformation. True transformation is acceptance that a lot of damage has been done in the world and to the world. Time is now to stop and time is now to come together and act before it's too late. Division gets in the way of true transformation because it does not allow us to see our shared humanity. In order to overcome this division, we need moral leaders, leaders who will unite us, who will help us to see our shared interdependent reality and inspire us to live in harmony, peacefully, and with equality and justice. We need to always keep in mind that what unites us is much bigger than our differences. And no side will ever thrive if the other doesn't get the respect and attention it deserves. Division is generally the outcome of ignorance and arrogance and can be exploited for personal gains. It can be mitigated by collaboration, by listening, global literacy, defining purpose in life and spirituality. The world our societies are deeply divided. This is caused by our own disconnect from our own humanity. We have to reach into the good in ourselves and believe that we can bridge the divide by touching the good in others. Then love will come and the doors of social transformation will be wide open. 
We need to bridge divides and bring people together, people of different beliefs, systems and parts of the world allowing them to work together. We need to understand our differences as individuals and put them aside in order to achieve our greater goals for the world. We must build trust between those who do not know how to trust in order to bridge the divides that we are faced with. Division is segmentation into smaller parts. While those smaller parts can survive in isolation from the whole, they can never thrive or comprise, much less transform the whole. To transform, we must combine and interact to create wholeness, holiness, something sacred and marvelous. And since the only change we can make is within ourselves, that is the place to start. It is so wonderful to hear from a range of perspectives on such an important issue. You will hear more from the community later on. But now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Henri Van Egan, Senegal's CEO, to share with you some insight into bridging leadership approach. We live in a world that is increasingly complex and interconnected. The interconnectedness has brought rapid change and progress in many areas, but it also calls for a greater need for trust as people and institutions around the world interact with each other in new ways. In so many places around the world we're losing trust, and maybe you too notice that we are becoming more and more polarized. For many, fear has become commonplace, and we're seeing increased levels of conflict. Indeed, our continued progress, even survival, demands that we close this trust gap. Hello. I'm Henry Van Egan, CEO of Synergos, a global organization that helps solve complex issues by advancing leadership that builds trust and collective action. We call this bridging leadership, and we believe there is a greater demand for it now than ever before. Bridging leadership is needed in many kinds of complex situations, whether it's used to resolve conflict or simply to build alignment among diverse stakeholders around a shared goal, leading to better results. It represents a paradigm shift in our approach to leadership, a movement away from less inclusive forms of decision-making that have dominated much of human history, a movement away from ego, hierarchy and fear. With bridging leadership, we see a clear shift in the way leaders act, from commander and controller to facilitator and convener, from sole owner of the problem and solution to shared responsibility, from having all the answers to being a creator of conditions in which answers emerge, from a single source of intelligence to a champion of collective wisdom, from monopolizing power to distributing power, enabling new solutions to emerge. Bridging leadership is self-reinforcing. It starts with trust and it builds trust. At Synergos, we build bridging leadership at three levels. First, at the individual level, where we help people use carefully honed skills to foster true collaboration across divides. We also build bridging leadership at the institutional level. Like individuals, organizations can also embody bridging leadership traits to facilitate partnerships across divides for social benefit. And bridging institutions exist at all sectors, from the private sector to civil society to government. We also apply bridging leadership as a framework for designing change processes. We do this both within and among organizations and communities. It can be used for structuring everything from workshops to programs spanning years. Being a bridging leader requires emotional security and humility. It means holding off on judgment and respecting the opinions and perspectives of all people. It means deeply understanding the views of others even if we may not agree. 
It means listening well, with empathy and self-awareness. It means being generous. Being empathetic and generous requires a great deal of inner work, which indeed is a key element of bridging leadership that we use at Synergos. Lastly, bridging leadership includes the ability to piece together multiple perspectives to create a more complete view of a problem. We call this system thinking. Together with partners around the world, we're supporting a new generation of leaders and change makers, the kind we need to meet our ever more complex problems. We're using bridging leadership to replace fear with trust, and we know it works. Thank you for sharing, Henri. Hi, I'm Marilia Bezerra, Managing Director of Philanthropy at Synergos, and I'm talking to you tonight from my home in New Paltz, New York. I bet you can even hear the crickets. We all just heard and he described the many qualities of a bridging leader, and it made me think. The interesting thing about it is that even if you don't quite grasp the whole concept, you do know a bridging leader when you see one. We can feel it in the way they don't shy away from challenging topics, how they call you into conversation, and how they create a nurturing space for new thinking and new action to emerge even when they are differing points of view. One of my favorite examples of a bridging leader was Mr. Rogers. For those of us who did not grow up in the US, I'll share that Mr. Rogers was the creator and host of a TV show for children. I got to know him as an adult, but I recognize his power to engage and connect. He preached challenging topics to little ones teaching them values like tolerance, inclusion, and love. But also, he did not shy away from talking about difficult issues like pain, trauma, disease, loneliness, even death. He invited them into a space of healthy growth. So, with your permission, I will do my very best to channel just a little bit of Mr. Rogers and invite you to take a moment, take a deep breath, and think about a bridging leader in your own life. And I'll invite you to write the name when you're ready on the chat. Over the years, we've celebrated many bridging leaders with the David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Awards. Best leaders include Nelson Mandela, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Michael Bloomberg, and Queen Rania of Jordan. This year, we've seen bridging leaders and the bridging leadership approach in action more than ever. We can all remember the photos of firefighters from around the world rushing to Australia to help with their wildfire season. The stories of strangers in Beirut helping each other following the August explosion, regardless of their background or religion. And we've seen a global community rally to the COVID-19 crisis, forging alliances that earlier might have seemed impossible working in collaboration with each other, we can all see that we are stronger. It's also been a time when we've seen certain people, organizations, and sometimes even nations, choose to shun a bridging approach, choosing to close in and to walk the path alone. The results of these types of choices speak for themselves. At Synergos, we are committed to our mission to nurture the bridging leaders of the future. And now we'll be joined by some of our program participants speaking to the role Synergos has played in their leadership development. He has helped me to get alternatives 
eu comecei a ver que tem outras oportunidades. Eu acho que esse programa é único. Desde o começo, vocês me trouxeram muitas informações que, às vezes, até sabia, mas, mas eu nunca tinha pensado por essa ótica é, mais ativo, mais proativo. Acho que é muito único nesse programa é essa visão e a metodologia que vem por trás, aplicada dentro desse contexto. É muito único. É, ele me possibilitou fazer imersões bem práticas, inclusive, tanto viagens como retiros. Possibilitou realmente olhar para dentro também. Possibilitou também eu ter uma zona segura é, de poder falar o que eu quiser. Para mim, Senegal has been really special, um, and it's really special because of the space it opens up for people to get to know each other and engage with each other. And that space is really shrinking in organizations. In a lot of organizations I work for, it's really getting things done there, you know, resources are scarce and I think we forget um, that we need to also deal with each other as humans and not just in our roles. E eu acho que o, o programa me trouxe bastante ferramentas. Essas ferramentas me, me trouxeram mais percepção, mais precisão e mais efetividade no meu trabalho. Me inspirei muito com as viagens, conheci pessoas incríveis que, são, que fazem coisas muito bacanas e principalmente eu acho que no programa eu conheci pessoas que queriam fazer e ao final do programa estavam fazendo. O curso me mostrou muito claro como fazer, que existe sim uma metodologia mas principalmente que existe uma rede maravilhosa. Foi como se tivessem tirado um véu da minha cara e eu falei, nossa, existe tudo isso. Realmente, estar com as sinagogas me enriqueceu a forma que eu vejo o meu trabalho, a forma que nós programamos, a forma que nós abordamos as comunidades. Quando você pensa sobre tools como like Sistine's Thinking, no passado, nós não pensávamos sobre as garotas, mas não pensávamos sobre as comunidades que eles vêm, de seus pais, das escolas, With that now, we think at all of them holistically because we know it's not just the girls. They have a community where they come from. Apart from that, there's also the government. The government has a, a major role to play. So we look at everything holistically as a result. Thank you, Henri, Marilia, and our program participants for their insights into bridging leadership which is what we are here to celebrate tonight. Before we get to the award, let's hear again from our community on the connection between division, transformation and leadership. I think it is power politics and certain leadership styles that fan the flames of division, create suspicion among people and conflicts of interest among groups. But I believe it is possible for groups to reconcile tensions and redefine their interests. And this is where bridging leaders and agencies like Synergos have a strong role to play. Amid grim headlines, people have become fatigued by worry. They need hope. And there is hope. By any objective measure, we have been living in the best period in human history. That may sound like wishful thinking, especially these days, But the data buried out, extreme poverty, disease, war, crime and hunger have all dropped significantly over the past quarter century. Even so, climate change and other problems pose an existential threat, one we can manage only by working together. That makes the quest for a modus vivendi the defining challenge of our time. Meeting that challenge requires trust. That's why Synergos cultivates and celebrates leaders who build the trust that make collaboration possible. Only by changing how we see ourselves and our place in the world will we be moved to take the necessary actions. The solution is in changing how we see the world, responding with empathy to others and working together to overcome the challenges facing us all. In my opinion, division starts when you put yourself in a position of a judge, when you decide what is right and what is wrong. So a way to overcome the division of this moment is actually when you put yourself out of your comfort zone, when you put yourself in other people's shoes, and then you realize that the reality that you know is completely different. It's a start for you to do in a work 
to develop empathy and realize that we are all connected. We can overcome division by challenging ourselves to be uncomfortable, to speak uh, to others that think differently and being both brave and vulnerable at the same time with those that are divided from us and divided between themselves. True transformation demands that we appreciate the interdependence and interconnectedness of our world and that we simply cannot progress when we are divided. A greater sense of empathy, selflessness and willingness can help us to unite towards changing the world together. And I believe that we're in times where we have to be bold enough and ask, and ask ourselves the hard questions, take positions, reflect that into actions, and really decide what future do we want to build? Is it one with, with more of the same as us? Or do we believe that we can create value from diversity, from differences? I choose diversity. So many divisions in this world can be overcome by a simple thing, empathy. The ability to be in someone else's shoes and feel their struggles. It is so simple, yet so difficult as well. But if you see what I see, if you feel what I feel, I implore you, try. Because when we feel someone else's struggles, we offer not our judgment, but compassion and solidarity. We live in a moment where our society is divided, polarized. We lose the ability to talk to the others, and that really uh, does not help us to move forward. More than any time, uh, we really need uh, to reach uh, to the others and to respect uh, people whom we may differ. Uh, with them politically or socially or whatever. Uh, we need to build bridges. Uh, we need civility in our society and we need leadership uh, to help us build these bridges. Thanks to everyone who has joined us so far. I hope you are leaving this program with a new understanding of what bridging leadership is all about. As Merlia said, we all know bridging leaders in our lives. We may not have the vocabulary to call them bridging leaders, but we know what they look like when we see them. And this is the core of Synergo's commitment to developing a new generation of bridging leaders from all over the world. Before the COVID crisis, Synergo's was about to launch a new initiative in Mexico, bringing together a cohort of 24 young leaders who would participate in a year-long training program. When the pandemic happened, we had to pivot to a new way of delivering this program. What at first seemed like a disappointment has become an opportunity, as we are now developing curriculum that can be delivered virtually regardless of where you are in the world. This moment has many challenges. Yet, as synagogues, we're optimistic about the future and what we can all accomplish together. In fact, for those of you who are watching at home, if you'd like to support our work in the world, please participate in our auction. We'll put a link in the chat right now. Next, you will hear directly from Synergo's chair and founder, and my good friend Peggy Delaney, talking about the history of Synergo's and the origin of the David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award. Before I turn it over to her, I want to take a moment to ask all of you to go to the chat again. Share one to three words of how you are feeling at this moment. It stems from when I was 17 in Brazil and I saw the absolute lack of connectivity between these migrants who come from very poor rural areas to the city in Rio, and it was favelas, squatter settlements, and they had so much energy and will to get out of poverty. And they had creativity, and there was no possibilities for them made available by the society, by the people or the government. 
And that gave me, at that very early age, it was only an impression, it wasn't a thought-out philosophy or anything, that this is the biggest resource, the people. And unless we make the connections to other groups, other levels, other sectors, that we're missing half the potential for solving the problems. It was probably 10 years into Synergos that I realized that in order to form partnerships where you had true collaboration between groups who were class-wise, ideologically, sectorally, in all ways different, there were certain people who stood out as having the kinds of characteristics that were willing to reach out across divides. And so we began to notice these people a lot of them were heads of community foundations because they had their feet at the grassroots and they had a reach. And we began to see that they had certain leadership characteristics that were very different from other types of leaders. The key components of good bridging leadership is the ability to empathize and the ability to listen deeply. The reason we started to focus on what we call bridging leadership is that the world is so divided on substantive issues, on process issues, on political issues. And what's needed is people who are what we call the allies in every sector, who have credibility with their own constituency, to come out of their own constituency and interact with people who are different from themselves. When we first started thinking about bridging leadership and people were asking me, well, how did you get to be interested in this? I went back to 1980 when I perceived that there was something about the way my father worked in the world, whether it was in business or diplomacy or friendship, that I thought was important, but I didn't know what it was. He was at that time writing his memoirs and he told me about his strategies to learn and connect with people in new situations. It was to get to meet with one person, have a discussion, and then get them to suggest other people he should meet with. So he was, in essence, learning from many people, being passed from hand to hand, and always reaching out to new people curious, open, which are aspects of bridging leadership. And I saw how he did it. I saw both his personality, his instincts, his skill at really making people feel comfortable and talking to people of all different backgrounds and gradually drawing them in. And I thought, hmm, that is something that's needed in the world. I think it's something that I have learned from him and I'd really like to share that in the world. Thank you, Zainab, for your great help in making the award program so joyful and special. We really appreciate it. We have three tremendous honorees this year, Mark Benioff, Christiana Figueres, and Eddie Ndopu. You'll hear from Paul Pullman in a moment to speak about Mark and then from Mark. And then later, we have a special conversation that I was fortunate to be part of with Christiana and Eddie. Christiana and Eddie were fast friends by the end of our time together and couldn't believe that they hadn't crossed paths before. It's now my honor to introduce Paul Pullman, who himself received the award in 2014. Paul. I nominated Mark for this award because he's a different kind of leader. We see that with Salesforce under Mark's leadership itself. Mark understands better than anybody else the power of a multi-stakeholder model and is an avid advocate of changing our current system of capitalism to make it more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. And once more, Salesforce is leading the way. People think of Salesforce as a technology company, but it views itself as more, connecting and enabling people to be more effective in their work through its cloud products. And that technology and mission for connecting is particularly important now under this pandemic. Mark has been a real leader during COVID in many ways, pointing 
to the importance of wearing masks, recognizing the toll that stress and isolation are having on each of us and calling out for approaches to the crisis that are based on partnership and not on fear. Let's hope that everybody is listening. The COVID crisis is a health crisis, but you know as well as I do that its effects go far beyond health. And responding to this crisis will require systemic, holistic approaches. And that's a key element of bridging leadership and a key element for Mark as well. It certainly is not new to Mark. He's long been an advocate for an inclusive workforce, inclusion of the LGBT rights, as well as gender equity, working on universal minimum wages, establishing one of the best hospitals in the region and caring for the homeless. But above all, a champion for the environment and a healthier planet. His latest is the One Trillion Tree campaign and his unstoppable work to preserve the oceans. I believe that he's a corporate leader who sets the standards for others and is willing to make allies in unlikely places if needed. Partnership is definitely one of his hallmarks. Now, we equally appreciate all that he's doing as a member of the B team. As a past recipient of the David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award, I'm delighted to share this honor with Mark. Congratulations to all of tonight's honorees. Hey, hello everyone. And uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here and uh, for this amazing award. And thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for everything that you do for the world every single day. Thank you for your kind words, your message, your leadership, your vision. Uh, we need you so badly right now. And thank you for your shared belief that business is the greatest platform for change. And Peggy and Henry and everyone at Synergos, thank you so much for this amazing recognition. I'm deeply grateful for everything that you do as well. And of course, it's great to share this with two amazing friends of mine, Christina. Of course, Christina, you are amazing. Everything that you have done for the environment, for the world, the Paris Accords will be eternally grateful. And Eddie, you're just an inspiration, an inspiration to me and so many others every single day for showing us that the impossible is possible and that we can all do whatever we set our minds to. Both of you are true heroes, and uh, I could not be more, more thrilled to call you friends of mine. So thank you for that. You know, this virtual gathering couldn't come at a more important time. We're in a moment of urgency. We all know that. We have a global pandemic, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, a global leadership crisis. We all have to decide what are we going to do to make a difference. And I think that when we look at business, well, I believe business is the greatest platform for change, that through multi-stakeholder action, we can create a new type of capitalism, a multi-stakeholder capitalism. And this is a tremendous opportunity. You know, Salesforce is an example of that. Of course, our shareholders have had a phenomenal return, 5,000% since we went public in 2004. But we've had a great stakeholder return as well. First, of course, our planet is a key stakeholder. We're a net zero company. Our employees are key stakeholders. They've done 5 million hours of volunteerism. We've been able to give away over $300 million in uh, grants to our local community, including over $100 million to our local public schools. And over 50,000 nonprofits and NGOs run on our platform for free. But these are just the beginning of what we can do to improve the world. Every one of us can do one thing. We all know that. And I believe this award, this Rockefeller Award, well, this is really evidence of that. So to everyone here, everyone who's watching, everyone at Synergos, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do every day. Um, I know we all need to do more, uh, but uh, it's nice to have this moment to celebrate what we have done and to realize that together, uh, as one incredible uh, humanity, there's so much more we can do. Thank you for everything. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. Um, this is a global broadcast, and so you may be having breakfast, lunch, or dinner while we're doing it. My name is Peggy Delaney, and I'm founder and chair of the Synergos Institute. And tonight, we are so fortunate to have two such outstanding leaders with us. 
our jury selected them from among many, many nominees uh, last November. That seems so long ago. So much has happened since then. But right now in October, 2020, I still believe they exemplify exactly the leadership that we need now. Christiana Figueres is best known for her role in the process that led to the historic Paris Agreement of 2015 dealing with climate change. Since then, she's founded Global Optimism, a purpose-driven enterprise focused on social and environmental change. Eddie Ndopu is the UN Secretary General's Global Advocate for Sustainable Development. He was a member of the first graduating class of the Africa Leadership Academy and founded Global Strategy for Inclusive Education. He's really leading the way in connecting inclusion to sustainability. So I'd like to begin with you, Christiana. You manage both challenge to both challenge and engage others in very difficult topics, dealing with deeply seated issues and beliefs that keep business and government leaders from taking the necessary action to halt, reverse, and mitigate climate change. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, thanks very much, Peggy. And, and first uh, to, to everyone, thank you so much for including me. In, uh, in this wonderful uh, award. And I feel deeply honored to be sharing it with Eddie, who I don't personally know yet, but we must repair that, uh, mm -hmm. that vacuum as soon as possible. So uh, my, my, my thanks and my congratulations to, uh, to Eddie. You, you mentioned Peggy, uh, yes, both, uh, both challenging, but also bringing people together. What, what I think is the um, necessary ingredient for being able to do that, both challenge and uh, engage people, is to see behind, behind and beyond the nameplate on the desk or on the door. Uh, yes, of course, we all play a certain role, whatever that is, you know, in corporations, in financial institutions, in international organizations, whatever. And we tend to think that those nameplates and those affiliations divide us. But the fact is that we're all human beings and that is what brings us together. And we tend mm -hmm. to forget that because we tend to look at the nameplate and the affiliation and then assume that there is a position that is unmovable. And uh, throughout my time at the UN, but also before and after, uh, what was always incredibly powerful to me and very moving is to be able to touch the humanity of every single person independently of their age, of their gender, of their role. We're all wonderful human beings. Mm -hmm. And if you can move beyond all of the trappings that tend to tell us that we have different interests, and if you touch the humanity from your humanity to someone else's humanity, there is then a very strong bridge as the bridge that you then continue to strengthen and, uh, and to stretch to include similar bridges with other people until you bring enough people together to do what needs to be done. That's beautiful. Eddie, you'd like to comment on anything that Christiana just said? Absolutely. Uh, well, first, Peggy, let me just extend my deep and very warm congratulations to Christiana. I am absolutely thrilled to be sharing the virtual stage with her. And I've been a long uh, admirer of the work that Christiana has done for our planet. So I'm absolutely delighted. And I could not agree more, Christiana, with what you've just said about weaving a tapestry, at really stitching a garment that we can all wear as humanity, regardless of who we are or where we come from. And I think that against the backdrop of what feels like such a precarious and scary time for humanity. I think now more than ever, we ought to really be thinking quite deeply about what it means to restore a sense of connection with the planet, with one another. Um, I think more than now more than ever, we need 
what is often called intersectionality to really understand what the connections are between the different crises that we find ourselves navigating through, um, but also where the solutions might be. You know, it, it tends to be the same communities, crisis after crisis after crisis, that bear the worst manifestations um, of these crises, right? So the same people that experience racial inequality in both the global north and the global south are the same people that experience the worst of the climate crisis. These are the same people that experience the worst in terms of economic deprivation. And so I think, you know, as Christiana said, that we need to be looking at the ways in which all of these seemingly unrelated issues sort of come together and, and produce um, a set of circumstances that becomes very difficult for people to bear. Um, and so I, I completely echo 100% um, what Christiana said, and I think that, you know, now is the time for us to really adopt an integrative and intersectional approach to the way that we do policymaking and the way that we think about leadership. So Eddie, thank you. That was a beautiful rumination on what Christiana said. And it fits very well with the question that I wanted to ask you anyway, which is that you have the ability to reach beyond the limiting thoughts that people have about disability and you help frame inclusion, not just as justice, but also as possibility. I'd really love to hear how you do that. I'll share a very special project that I'm currently working on. I, I'm trying to set the wheels in motion to become the first physically disabled person to travel into space. And this is really part of a larger endeavor to demonstrate to humanity that people with disabilities, people from marginalized segments of society do the work of defying gravity each and every single day by virtue of our existence. And I truly believe that that's what we are able to do as humanity. We're able to harness our individual capacity to um, be resilient, to really go through the worst things that life can throw at us and emerge from these things better people and better human beings. And so the quest for justice, I fundamentally believe, is a quest for self-actualization. Uh, when I think about the sustainable development goals, when I think about inclusion at large, this is really about enabling people to breathe freely in the world, to take a breath and just truly inhabit what it means to be a human being living on the planet today. So all of these things that we do, they, you know, they tend to be seen as these abstract public policy enterprises, but they're not. It really is about according people dignity according people self-actualization, the ability to breathe freely, the ability to exist um, unhindered um, by the various structural inequities that exist in society. And so understanding the work that I do and my activism through that lens has really enabled me to speak differently and speak in a way that resonates with people because I think ultimately as activists, as humanitarians, as policymakers, the work that we do is really to create the conditions for people to exercise some possibility and some agency in their lives. Um, and, and so that, that has helped me a great deal as a young activist, you know, to reframe my work differently. That's such a powerful image, allowing people to breathe freely in the world. Christiana, um, in your new book, you talk about um, three different mindsets that you believe we need to hold to trigger transformation. And I wonder, building on the collaboration idea that you've talked about earlier, if you could both say the name of your book so that everybody gets it, and also tell us a little bit about those three mindsets that we need. Well, thanks, Peggy. Um, yeah, th thanks for letting me plug the book. Um, 
it's uh, entitled The Future We Choose, and it's uh, co-written with my co-author, Tom Rivett Carnett, with whom I have worked for many years. Um, it is it is a book about climate change. It's not a difficult book to read because we wanted to bring climate change to the kitchen table. Um, so it's very much of a uh, an, an understandable and digestible book on climate, but more, more than on climate and what we can do about it. It honestly is a book about what we humans have the potential to do on climate, but on many other things as well, if we tap into who we are. Um, and if we adopt an attitude that, uh, that, that does not let us drown in despair and grief uh, and put us into the black box of uh, paralysis, because honestly, of course, there's bad news every day. Obviously, that's predictable. Let's not be surprised that there's bad news. But what we can do and must do is choose every single day. How do we choose to act in front of the reality that is given to us? Do we choose to accept the reality that is given to us? Or do we choose to use everything that we have everything, all our, our, all our conviction, all our creativity, all our innovation, our entire potential, do we choose to unleash all of that to create a different reality? And in as much as we do that every single day, then we're demonstrating what we call stubborn optimism, which is not an optimism that just assumes that things are going to be fine. I can just sit here and twiddle my thumbs and everything will be fine. I'm not going to do anything. No, this is an optimism that is not the result of an achievement. It's optimism that is the input, the necessary input to any challenge. Now, Eddie's saying that he wants to be the first person with physical disability that goes into space. If that is not stubborn optimism, I have never seen an example, a more serious stubborn optimism than that. And I totally treasure that, right? Because as he says, defying gravity, not just, you know, by going to outer space, he is defying the gravity that would pull our thinking down because we have a mental gravity here. It's not just the physical gravity. It's mental gravity that wants to pull us down and say, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other. Now, we have to understand that that gravity does not keep us down. We have the potential to rise above those, those challenges, to rise above those barriers and create the reality that we know is a better reality, the reality that we want to see, not the reality we're seeing now. So that attitude of a stubborn optimism, um, and we call it stubborn because every time somebody will want to pull you down and you just have to keep on going. So we call it stubborn optimism. And that has to be from a climate perspective and from a planet perspective, that has to be unleashed on nature. We have to be able to regenerate nature because we have already caused so much damage on nature and uh, and it is having the kinds of effects that we're already experiencing under COVID-19. So we have to go out there and we have to have an attitude of regeneration, regenerate ourselves, our own spirit, and with that regenerated spirit, then go out and regenerate nature and do all of that in collaboration with each other, radical collaboration. There's no way that Eddie is gonna go to space on his own. And there's no way that one person or two or three are going to address climate on their own. We have to do this in collaboration uh, with each other. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a question of what mindset do you choose to, um, to go out into the world with. Eddie, if you could comment um, both on the very powerful words that Christiana said, and also, um, well, what you personally do to avoid despair or fear, and, and how you motivate others to do the same. Well, I, I mean, first of all, Peggy, I'm, I'm just so incredibly moved and inspired by Christiana's framework of stubborn optimism, because I feel I, I'd never had the language of stubborn optimism growing <laughs> up. 
but it is what stubborn optimism, I think was the magic sauce for my own life. You know, I, I, the reason why I'm so moved and honored to share space with you now is because I can't help but think about that as I'm speaking to you right now, 90% of children with disabilities across the developing world have never seen the inside of a classroom. 90%, right? That's a staggering statistic. And I could have been part of that statistic. And I'm speaking to you as one of the very few African disabled people who've graduated from the University of Oxford. And I, it's not just a personal achievement, but it is a symbolic victory on behalf of these millions of precious kids whose lives get rendered invisible because nobody decided to invest in their potential. And so Christiana, I want to thank you really for giving me language and all of us language to insist on stubborn optimism because I think this is, it, it, and, and it speaks to what you've just said, Peggy, about unlocking vulnerability and unlocking potential because I think in order for us to demonstrate stubborn optimism, we need to open our hearts and open our imaginations because I think, you know, the crisis of COVID, the crisis of climate, the crisis of inequality, I think speaks to a crisis of the imagination, the, the inability to dream ourselves out of the current world order. And I think that is what vulnerability is about. It is about our capacity, our emotional capacity to stretch ourselves in terms of what is possible. Um, and that is the kind of leadership that I think is so desperately needed in this moment. A leadership that insists on stubborn optimism, that builds bridges, but also I think repairs this crisis of imagination, this fear of dreaming. Um, it, it, it really is a fear of stretching ourselves beyond the limitations that are imposed on us, right? And, and, and I think about that container as a glass container is being able to see ourselves into society and, and, and beyond the limits that are often placed on us. And so for me, I, I think that is, and, and Christiana, you're so right. It's not, it, it, stubborn optimism isn't a, a sort of foolhardy um, embrace that everything is gonna work out okay, but it really is a belief in the power of the human spirit that is what enables me to get by every morning to wake up is that I truly believe in the power of the human spirit to really overcome obstacles, but also to defy gravity, both literally and figuratively. Um, and, and so for me, the, the, I, I try to remember that it really is, I, I fundamentally believe in the power of the human spirit and the, and the imagination of the human spirit. Thank you, Eddie. So before we go to closing, I wonder if either of you have a question for the other. I don't mean to be dominating this conversation with the questions. And Yeah, I, I have a question for Eddie. Eddie, here's my question. How come, I have, I have concluded from this conversation that you and I are twin souls. Yeah. And so how come we're twin souls and we're only just meeting today? That's my question. <laughs> I, you know what, Christiana, I agree. We, we are kindred spirits. And I think it took, it took Peggy and, and the universe to conspire in, in our favor to connect us. So I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I guess, you know, I, I have a question for you as, as well. I, um, you know, have long admired your work and, and you are really at the forefront of giving us this new um, kind of leadership what are you optimistic about our leaders globally right now? And, and what do you think stubborn optimism and your philosophy might mean for 
multilateralism and global cooperation, which we so desperately need right now. I, I'd just be curious to, to, to sort of glean your wisdom and, and hear from you what, what you think about that. Well, um, it's a very important question, Eddie. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I do view the world as uh, having internally conflicting forces uh, that are not mutually exclusive and that we have to hold uh, in equal standing. Um, and so according to that, uh, I do believe in both outrage and optimism. In fact, that's the title of our podcast, Outrage yeah. and Optimism. And so that's the way I want to answer your question. I am outraged at the lack mm -hmm. of responsibility of some leaders of some countries, and we don't have to mention them because we know what we're talking about. I am deeply outraged. I'm deeply outraged about their lack of responsibility. And we are still crawling forward when we should be galloping forward because we have everything at hand, right? So I'm outraged about all of that. Now, I'm also very optimistic because every day, Eddie, I meet more and more people that are waking up and that are understanding that the future of this planet is too important and too big to be put as the sole responsibility of a few elected people who are leading their countries. The fact is the future of this planet is everyone's responsibility everyone's responsibility. Yes, there are some people who are there, you know, sitting behind some kind of a desk. But the fact is that all of us share in that responsibility and in the opportunity to create something new. And so I am just thrilled to see especially so many young people, Eddie, so many young people who are throwing themselves forward to say, we're not going to put up with this I'm not going to use the noun, okay? But you know what I mean. We're I just not going to put up with this dot, dot, dot anymore. We are going to ensure that we create the planet, the world, the conditions that we know are the ones that we have to have for our well-being and, um, and for justice and for our health. Um, and so I'm totally delighted. I am so delighted about leadership, not top down. There's some top down. I mean, talk about enlightened top down leadership, New Zealand, right? What a fantastic prime minister New Zealand has. Yeah. But that is not what we have everywhere. So I'm not utterly impressed by top down leadership, but I am fundamentally impressed and truly grateful for bottom-up leadership that I see coming every day for more and more sectors, for more and more countries, for more and more, especially young people. Now, I do not fall into the irresponsible crowd to say, thank God for young people, they're gonna solve this. Because honestly, it's my responsibility, my generation that has caused this mess. And we have a huge responsibility to at least veer off the worst and then have young people take it from there. So I don't hand over the responsibility immediately, the baton to young people, because I think that we still have a lot of repairing to do, but I totally welcome their oncoming uh, leadership and their much more integrated and holistic thinking and acting and planning which is just such a breath, a breath of fresh air. So that's where I get my optimism. And I'm still outraged at some things. <laughs> so actually that statement um, begins to answer the last question that I wanted to pose to both of you that, that Eddie, I'd love to have you comment on. Because this audience that you're talking to is an audience of a very loving, powerful and committed people. They're already doing a lot. And it can be overwhelming, as I'm sure sometimes you both feel, to feel that you're doing so much and we're not collectively getting the results that we seek. So I'm wondering if from your own experience, your own stubborn optimism, your own focus on collaboration, you might have um, suggestions for the people in the audience. Is it a matter of doing more or is it a question of doing it differently? Or how can they best use whatever power and privilege they have to bring about 
the future that we all want. So I'd love to hear comments from both of you, starting with you, Eddie. Wow, that's those are really, you know, a big set of, 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 of questions. I, I would say it's it's probably both. It's doing more and doing things differently. But I would also say that we can pace ourselves mm. and that we don't have to operate alone. In fact, we should not be operating in isolation. I think that it is so important that we reach out to people who are like-minded, but, and like-minded doesn't necessarily mean people who agree with us, but people who are committed to decency and dignity and a sense of hope and optimism for the planet and for our collective futures. So people who are profoundly committed to humanity, mm -hmm. reaching out to them and locking arms, interlocking arms, and really moving forward as a movement, right? I, 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 you know, we use the word Ubuntu quite a lot. It's sort of become a buzzword, but if we really look deeper, um, sort of beneath um, just like the superficial <laughs> use of the word, it, it really is a profound recognition of our mutual humanity. And so, you know, that would, be my advice is that we are, um, and, and, you know, Christiana, you said this earlier, that, you know, we're never going to be able to do it as individuals. You know, we need to be able to rely on one another, right? And the great gift of my work as a disability activism is that disability has taught me that we need interdependence. I rely on people to get out of bed in the morning. I, I, I need help with being fed. But what that, the power in that, the power on needing people is precisely in the recognition of interdependence and creating an interdependent world, right? And so it, it would be, I guess, just needing more of each other and, and feeling I suppose it comes back to vulnerability as well, feeling okay with saying that, that we need one another. And, and I think there's such an effort to not need one another uh, with the kind of sort of strongman politics that is defining this moment in history is that the antidote to that is, is, is humility and a greater sense of, of the mutual recognition of our humanity. So I, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but that, that is, um, you know, sort of w what I would say. Deeply, deeply makes sense. Christiana, would you like to add? I guess one way of um, giving perhaps an executive summary of what Eddie has so eloquently said is there is, there is a deep difference between the term another and the term one other, uh, one another. Um, so let me, say, let, let me see if I can, I, it just struck me as Eddie was speaking and I haven't thought about this before so I'm gonna think it and speak it at the same time. We tend to think that other people, that is another person, that is someone who works in another sector that is another opinion, that is another point of view, that is another interest. And that term another is a huge wall between us because the moment I think of you or your interests or your needs as being another, then I have immediately separated us. And then there's no bridging possibility. If we actually understand that it's not about another, it's about one another. It's about needing one another, needing each of us, understanding that we are all interconnected. We're all interlinked. We all belong on this incredible tapestry. And that includes not just human beings, it includes all living creatures and all living beings on this planet. We all depend on each other. 
Where do we get our water? From nature. Where do we get our food? From nature. Where do we get the oxygen that we breathe? From nature. So it's all interdependent, right? Um, and so the moment that we stop our otherism thinking, the other, the other, the other, and we begin to understand that we depend on each other and that it, this is about understanding one another, well, then we bring down that dividing wall. And it's, it's, a, it's a shift in mentality, right? And it's something that all of us can do. All of us can do. And you know, Peggy, I am surprised how many times I catch myself during the day thinking other, looking over at that person and going, well, that person is not doing their job properly or, you know, whatever. Um, we just fall into that other thing and other thinking and putting people into boxes and into categories. And, and it's a question of mental discipline. Wait, 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 wait. That person is doing their job under the circumstances that that person has. They're doing the best that they can under those circumstances. So am I. None of us are perfect. And we're all joined in, in doing the best that we can. And, and, and we can all do better than the best that we can right now. Because as soon as we understand that we're all interlinked and that we depend on each other, we depend on, on, on one another, um, it's a very different conversation. Yeah. Um, so that's a different way of saying what Eddie was actually much more eloquently saying than I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. I'm just, I noticed I keep, my hand keeps wandering to my heart chakra. And I know what that is, it's gratitude. I just feel so grateful for the existence of both of you in this world, for the fact that our wonderful panel of jurists was able to select the two of you. <laughs> and um, much gratitude for the wisdom that you shared. I'm sure that our audience will be equally grateful once they hear it. Thank you so much. Peggy, thank you for this conversation. I think we will all benefit from Christiana's stubborn optimism. I am inspired by these two leaders and we all need that inspiration. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our special musical guest, Tuelo. Tuelo is based in New York and born in South Africa. She has taken New York by storm with her bold, soulful music. She received many praises, including from HuffPost who called her New York's best singer and the world's. She has graciously gifted us with a song tonight. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Tuelo. I am a New York musician born in South Africa, currently quarantined in South Africa. <laughs> what interesting times we live in. I'd like to share with you my songs. I hope you enjoy.
For our final chorus of voices, we're going to hear some specific examples of direct action the Synergos community is taking around the world to turn division into transformation. It's a very an important moment in the history as we've seen what's happening in the United States of America and around the world. It's the right time for us to really talk about hard issues and have leaders who are going to sacrifice and able to change the system. I want to say that real change requires being open about racial bias and holding the philanthropic community responsible. Only then will leaders from all backgrounds have an equal chance at success. True transformation is when everyone is able to bring the expertise and vision to the table. Sometimes we find clues in very simple things. The word division, tied to the word individual. Individual in the 15th century English language meant non-divisible and obsolete meaning today. Perhaps there's a clue there. Within Australia, I think if there is a willingness to co-create solutions for indigenous peoples, I think if there's a willingness to share power between Indigenous interests and non-Indigenous interests, in particular those that are represented by the public sector, and then at the private sector level, I think if there's a, uh, an enthusiasm to deploy capital to initiatives that create impact and that build true transformation in the lives of Indigenous peoples, then we find that there are easier steps and these are ways forward to help us develop sustainable outcomes for indigenous peoples on their own country. Let us use science to connect you, to promote good values, to build trust, and to break the barriers. Women and girls are faced with a systemic challenge in most aspects of their lives, which not only harms them, but also robs us all of their most potentials. Whereas true transformation can only occur when all the issues of division are properly addressed according to its respective context. Division as we're seeing in so many aspects of our lives, undermines our empathy for others, creating a dynamic where people are unwilling to find solutions together for positive and lasting change. We surround ourselves with the people and information that support our own views, not taking the time to seek solutions to the challenges we all share. Ron Bruder, a Jewish man created a foundation where the main beneficiaries of the programs are Arab youth, which might at first appear to be an unworkable partnership. But what we have discovered is that we're far less divided than one might assume. Two parties divided by politics, by religion, and by history have cast division aside and recognized the need to achieve a greater goal, economic empowerment that benefits all. Out of every dark time, there's always opportunity to awaken, grow, and renew. Through positive intention, we overcome fears without division on separation. You must look from different angles and use this transformative period to pause on judgment and build unity and voice for all. To grow as friends, 
children, parents, leaders, or simply humans, we must transform both within ourselves and amongst each other. And yet, the reality of our world is to be divided. Division is fear. Division is pain masked as courage. Division is a memory that looks familiar but does not quite feel the same. And yet, we hold tight to the recognizable. But to conquer that division, we let go. Because true transformation calls for us to lessen our grip, let go of our pain, and seek new courage. Courage in ourselves, courage in each other. All is about bridging the gap to let the planet heal, enabling its survival on a new basis where equity, dignity, and humanism are the hallmarks of the new world. This is the way of true transformation. To mitigate the divisions of this moment, we need to recognize, respect, and accept the dignity of every single human being, regardless of gender, creed, level of education, rich or poor. We are all human beings with the same dignity and rights. Thank you to everyone who joined us live to watch today's program. I send you my warmest wishes for a healthy and safe remainder of the year. Congratulations again to our honorees. And I pray that we all come together with love and bridging and dialogue to create unity in our divided world. Thank you. <laughs>